Hello everyone, I am James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And is it just me or is this getting a teensy weensy bit samey? How are we just beginning to think, hang on, this has got the slight whiff of boring about it. The whole lockdown, the whole sense that every day you look at the news list and you think, okay, the top nine items are going to be a story in some form or other about coronavirus followed by some weird tale that involves either an animal or possibly a cute and charming story of love in lockdown or weirdly a celebrity whose life has taken a turn um, that seems almost more irrelevant than it did to begin with and so this week as we start our weekly open news meeting I start it with a plea if you like which is I'm beginning to find that I've got an appetite, I know people are different on this, that I've got an appetite for stories about other things. And so should we be beginning to think about the world, not beyond COVID-19, because we're obviously gonna live with it for a fair old while, um, there seems to be a political will to promise a vaccine uh, sometime this summer. And there seems to be in policy making and medical circles, a wish to, explain to people that it's more likely to take a year, year and a half, two and a half years. So if you're beginning to think this is part of our everyday lives, how do we get the balance right in our news agenda, in our uh, rhythm of the news, uh, in thinking about things that are separate and in some ways unrelated to what's happening in the dealing with, dealing with the pandemic. Um, so as, as we talk about uh, some of the items that are on our agenda at the moment. I'd love to hear from people saying um, what do we think we should look at that's beyond separate, entirely unrelated uh, to the pandemic. But I'm just going to give you a run, if I may. The, the, this open news meeting, as you know, is like the one that we used to hold in our newsroom on a Tuesday at lunchtime. Everyone comes in. We'd have a quick run around what we were working on, what seemed to be landing, what not. Talk a little bit about the project we're thinking about and um and then talk a little bit about or hear from people uh, what we think um uh, we should uh, should be looking at too so uh, i can see beginning to people are beginning to weigh in on the chat i'm going to bring you in i know most people here are dab hands at uh, at how uh, zoom works but just in case uh, weigh in on the chat there's a tab at the bottom uh, if you want to look at the participants list see who's here but also raise your hand please do that uh, and let's get going i'm going to um I, i'm going to start i just want to see if uh, basha uh, i know basha uh, Cummings uh, has been the editor working on our um, social care uh, file this week. I suppose this has been one of the cases uh, where what we've tried to do journalistically is take a subject that's been in the news now for for a couple of months and you might say actually been in the news for many years and try and understand it and so if you've had the chance to um, read the file, it started yesterday uh, with a piece about the structure of the social care business uh, in the UK and the issues that arise out of, I suppose, uh, some of the issues that arise at least out of uh, the financing structures, out of private ownership, out of offshore financing, out of the cost of debt. Um, we, we looked at that yesterday. Today, what we've looked at is what's happening in, uh, in Spain. And, and the thing that's interesting there is about the extent to which lawyers, both for families, but also for uh, state authorities, are beginning to weigh in on the, uh, on the question about the, the, the ownership and the management of those care homes. And given the way in which finance has moved into that particular sector, this is one of those, uh, this is one of those cases where you're really, I think, seeing what's driving the news, i.e. the economics of it and the structure of it, rather than um, rather than just think about um, the the if you like the political arguments that are dominating it. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, start start if I might by bringing in some of the uh, some of the people who I know uh, are, who are already saying they've got thoughts about how we should go go about it. I see uh, that some people are mostly discussing what Merapi, my colleague and fellow editor, may or may not be drinking in her garden. Um, I think we do have a drink in Merapi coming up in the next few days, um, so that might be. Uh, 
um, um, uh, useful. So um, I, I, um, I'm going to I'm going to bring Giles in because Giles has done something that he he rarely does, but Piers Morgan does often, um, which is write something in caps. Um, Charles, so your, your, your point is that we should try and get a grip on how well these vaccines or these vaccine trials are progressing. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. I was just stunned. Uh, I've never worked at the BBC, but I know you have. Yeah. Um, oh, I remember years ago failing miserably at an interview at the BBC. They didn't give me a job because we had different views on what constituted news. This is yeah. decades ago. But yesterday, while the Oxford vaccine trial, and I'm sorry to distract from the excellent um, theme of, of our files, I'm sure we'll come back to care homes in Madrid in a minute, but um, while the Oxford vaccine trial seemed to stumble because of a post by uh, a Harvard public health professor who was not involved with it, which he put on Forbes, and was sort of gradually picked up by the papers, the Moderna trial, which is the most interesting one, uh, being run by a small company that has never brought a vaccine to trial before, but did um, have sufficiently successful phase one results, a, an efficacy signal, I think is the phrase, to send the markets pretty nuts, yeah. was totally ignored. And I'm just, I, I'm genuinely baffled as to what, how we could have 35 minutes of news at 10 last night in the BBC with not a mention. I mean, fair enough, you can make a decision that this is very preliminary. It would, it would be um, unwise to get people's hopes up on the basis of phase one trials. But, but, but the fact that the markets reacted the way they did, is, it was surely a story. And I was just, I was very perplexed that I switched on, especially to see what the BBC's take on it was going to be. And there was nothing. Yeah. And Charles, can you just explain, I'm going to come to Kerry in a second. Can you just explain, so, so I think there is something really interesting here, which is less about vaccines and more about markets coverage, which is there is a, right. there's a really weird treatment of, uh, the markets themselves are really hard to understand at the moment. They're much more bullish than people. Um, but part of their bullishness, it seems to me, is rooted in this belief that governments are injecting so much money that the kind of macro picture economically gives them reason to be buoyant about that money, you know, feeding into the marketplace. But the other half of it is about the healthcare track, is a, is a bullishness about the delivery of vaccines. And if you like, that we as individuals can't envisage a moment that we get out of it. But if you listen to the signs that are coming from the pharmaceutical sector, actually, they think they're making better progress than they've ever made on any vaccine. Yeah. The reason I was confused by the Moderna case was, it seems as though it was a, it was a trial on eight people. Is that correct? Is that yeah. statistically significant? And, and the thing that I didn't understand, Charles, about it was, you know, when you did the SenseMaker live on vaccines, and we had some of the people in working on, on, uh, on, um, on Oxford, you talked a lot about RNA, mRNA vaccine development that have never developed, that never delivered. But this Moderna one is an mRNA. Uh, it, it is, and that it, and that's a perfectly legitimate reason to uh, put it, shove it down the news list. Uh, likewise, the the small number of people involved in the early trial. Um, I, I point taken, absolutely. Uh, and I may have got that wrong. Katie's saying I, it's not eight people; it's eight people who tested positive. Is it, I'm, uh, I, I don't. I, sh I should have the numbers on my fingertips, and I don't. As, um, uh, as I recall, it was statistically significant, um, but perhaps with a sample size that small, e even that is is hard to say. But, but it was the market the reaction. Between, uh, Charles, I think the relationship between it and the markets itself is amazing, and, uh, and it is weird that the. That it's not being it's not been entirely covered uh, and i'm an eeyore i i described myself in SenseMaker last week as as a vaccines eeyore i think i think um um you sent me something last week uh, uh, about precisely that sort of optimism within the industry which seems to me uh, just as, as as a lay observer um uh ill founded on the basis of experience um but i uh, Chris, the great Chris Cook has, has pointed out that the vaccine story is the story. Mm. So I was very uh, perplexed that this um, interesting wrinkle went unremarked on. Mm. 
Okay, well, well, Josephine Moult has come to our rescue and pointed out in the FTA report there were just 45 participants for the early stage and the data on antibodies was only available for eight of those. Charles, before I just before I just go to Kerry on this, can I just ask you one thing? The, so what's the update from Oxford? Because, again, I'm still trading off information that's now a fortnight old where they seem quite positive about the capacity of their tests or at least their their platform to, to work well with people? Uh, I think they are clinging to some optimism. I did actually try to get an update from them yesterday after the Moderna uh, results came out. Uh, and this p uh, piece in Forbes by, I think his name is Hazeltine. Mm. Um, and they're saying nothing at, at the moment. The um, doubts raised uh, by Hazel, Harvard's Hazel team yesterday over the Oxford trial, they would not comment on. They revolved around um, a virus still being found in the noses of the macaque monkeys that were the subject of the trial that was itself the subject of a very upbeat story in the New York Times about two weeks ago. Okay. Um, so it was basically a new take on existing uh, Oxford results by someone who is not a part of the process, but nonetheless in, in informed. Uh, um, uh, as, as I understand it, what the, the uh, early monkey results conducted in the States as part of the Oxford trial showed was that um, the vaccine that they're using, which is based on a common cold um, platform, um, does not eradicate the virus in the people who are vaccinated, does not ensure uh, that the subjects cannot infect others, but does show some sign of preventing the people vaccinated, or um, excuse me, the subjects, because we're talking about uh, monkeys here, getting the, the full COVID-19 disease. So okay. th there's that distinction between infection or ability to infect and, and getting the disease. Right. And, okay. and, and, and the gold standard is to prevent both obviously. Right. And, and what, what, what this post pointed out yesterday was that uh, on the evidence accumulated so far, the Oxford vaccine delivers on one but not on the other, not the gold standard. Okay. Kerry, what do you think on this? I mean, I, I agree with Giles. I, mean, I think actually the truth is we're probably getting too excited about all of this. So I wouldn't have put it on the news yesterday um, because I think we, we're turning this into a sort of World Cup of vaccines. Yeah, and we're looking yeah. at it, I think, from a kind of slightly parochial point of view. So we're rooting for the Oxford one. And you're seeing that repeated in you know, all the countries around the world where, where people are looking for this stuff. Um, I think, you know, Giles would make this point as well. It's, it is a very long and haphazard process. And people don't really know what phase one and phase two and you know, all the various efficacy and safety phases consist of. So I guess my worry is that you know we could we could you know we could trace minutely all these developments in the Oxford trial and the Moderna trial in the you know I think there were seventy or eighty vaccines in development yeah. around the world, um, and I'm not sure in the end at this stage, which is phenomenally early, um, that it's a very fruitful exercise at all. Yeah. It does. I mean, there is this, there is the element of the day trader. Now I saw Paul Cottrell. Um, Paul, you were saying in the chat that you that you think that phase three for the Oxford trial starts next week, and that and that they're focusing on or they say looking at testing with a community of people, GPs, and working in care. I know you were kind enough to join us last night to talk particularly about care homes. But are you going to be take part in the trial? Um, my care home hasn't been invited yet because we're a bit out of range uh, from the one in the northwest, which is going yes. ahead. Um, so I, I would if it came by the care and kind of stuff, but um, there'll be plenty of people who will, will join in anyway. It won't be short. I think there's about, uh, they're looking for between 500 and 1,000 around my way. Around your part, in your part of the world. And, it, yeah. and, it, and it's care home by care home, are you? They're, they're, they're they're just, looking... Yeah, they're just in that. Um, well, it's going through care home managers. So I'm not, I'm not sure whether, whether it's going through groups or to individual care home managers. Uh, and they're looking... I'm, I'm not sure how they're doing the sample. I, I wouldn't be that particular about it. 
and, and, and because this has been one of the things that I've been trying to work out is how do they do vaccine testing when the R number comes below one? The yeah, reason I don't want to get on with it quick. <laughs> yeah. I presume the reason why they're coming to care homes and GP surgeries is that there's going more likely to be an exposure there. Yeah, that's what, that's what I, I'm understanding. All right. Well, I'm going to, um, uh, th there are a number of other people I'd love to uh, um, uh, uh, bring in, but I'm going to, uh, Ian Hamilton has kindly offered to answer my plea for stories that are non-COVID related. So <laughs> Ian, what's you, wh wh where do you think we should be looking? Well, it is partly COVID related. Um, the, the whole um, debate about uh, hiding behind the science and listening to scientific advice got me thinking. I'm an academic, I should declare. I have a, a declaration of interest to make here. Um, but it got me thinking again about why academics don't engage with the media. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a, a whole host of reasons for that. Um, you know, it can be a mistrust of how the media will treat them. Um, but I think there's some cultural issues that would be quite good to unpack as well around hierarchies within academic teams. Um, so junior researchers don't want to upset their professorial bosses. Um, I, I think there's a whole host of reasons why academics um, don't engage with the media as a whole. There obviously are some who do. Um, but of course, I think hearing a wider range of voices at this time is be critical um, you know whether you're talking about vaccines whether you're talking about um, social behavior so it is partly COVID related but it does point to a much wider um, issue that was there prior to COVID and will continue to be there after COVID as well. It's, it's, it, it is interesting I mean it, the, the, the conversation is an interesting forum that's tried to um, do something about that actually enable um, enable that conversation and weave in academic expertise into the into the broader conversation not just about policy but about uh, you know news news as it happens and from the front as at the BBC we look to do something we look to do something similar um, for, for example it's been quite interesting on this social care question one of the real issues is how do you match what we're learning about business what we're learning about the politics of it and some and, and some real analysis on the on the policy side and 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 listen ian thank you I, we'll look into that i don't know whether chris is if, if chris cook is here today actually he's the person i'd normally reach uh speak to but i'm not sure that he's on at the moment um i, I would like to if i could though, bring in megan kenyon because um uh megan makes a point about the financialization of student housing which is, hello, Megan, which is extraordinarily close to actually the conversation we ended last night about the financialization of care homes. Um, and just, can you tell us a little bit, I don't know whether you're a student or you're living in student housing, or you're running yeah. an enormous network of highly leveraged student housing businesses, but, but whichever one it is, do you want to tell us your perspective on it? Um, so I'm a fourth year student at the University of Edinburgh, so I'm just finishing up my studies now, but... Um, I was just kind of there was um, a big movement in my sort of friendship circles to talk about the way that the city had changed over the past few years, yeah. especially with the um, uh, construction of so much luxury accommodation. Um, and there was actually an article in uh, a student magazine at the university about how the city centre had changed over five years. And a lot of that was to do with um, student accommodation. Um, and there was an article in The Guardian, I think, in m either February or March, which basically um, pointed out that I think it was Blackstone had paid um, something like £4.7 for the student housing firm IQ. Yeah. Um, and obviously, a lot of other student housing companies are owned by, you know, banks or hedge funds and things like that. Um, but then there's the other added sort of um, caveat to that, which is um, that currently in Edinburgh, um, student housing rents sit at 112% of the maximum maintenance loan you can get. So it's right. almost as if, you know, people, students are coming into the city um, where their university is and they can't actually afford to um, use this luxury accommodation, the student accommodation, which is, which is there already. So um, these accommodation blocks attract a lot of international students yeah. um, and obviously bringing COVID um, 
when uh, with obviously the travel restrictions and things like that, these students won't be coming over. So these accommodation blocks will be sitting empty and it, you just wonder what impact that will have on city centres. I mean, mm -hmm. COVID has kind of sped that on, but I think it was something that was coming anyway because these rents are going up and up and up mm. and more and more, you know, people won't be able to even afford living in these accommodation blocks. So I just think it's quite an interesting issue, which no one seems to really have got into very much. No, I mean, the interesting thing, I'm going to ask Tamsin Sterling, because as you were speaking, Megan, uh, she messaged that to say that she's in Cardiff and, and seeing something similar. You know, the thing that the, it's a really, really good thought to do, the Blackstone deal is a really good one to look into because it happened, didn't it, just before COVID. I think it was the largest or one of the largest property deals of, of its kind, certainly in the university or student accommodation sector. And if the pattern that we've seen in care homes is right, where you see the freezing of revenue from state supported residents um, and then higher prices from international residents continue, then there is potentially a read across there in that it would make sense that if the likes of Blackstone are seeing a collapse in their international student revenues, that has in some form or other a knock on, not only in the value of their business, but potentially in what they do well, the service they provide and how they price it for you know domestic residents for uk uk students so uh, tamsin are you there uh, um, yeah yeah i um i yeah i live in um cardiff i'm a housing um researcher and policy person i've worked in housing for 30 years okay. and yeah. i've lived in cardiff for over 20 years watched how my city's changed I've had an absolute explosion in purpose-built student accommodation the tallest buildings in cardiff are all student accommodation one called Zenith, delightful, ugly building of 700 units, as they call them. Um, the thing with student housing, it's not defined either as domestic accommodation or commercial. It's got a different planning use class built to a lower quality um, space standard, etc. Although quite a lot of this communal space, sort of funky communal space, but quite low standards. Doesn't have to make any contribution to what's called Section 106. So no contribution to affordable housing. City. What, what, sorry, forget, forgive me, tell me, what is Section 106? Section 106 is a requirement in the planning system for um, developers to make a contribution um, for uh, the developments they're building. Um, it can go into affordable housing, it can go into transport infrastructure. It's gen generally to recognise the, imp the, imp the uh, a financial way through planning of recognising the impact of a new development on a place. Mm -hmm. like you might need a new school, you might need affordable housing you might need new transport etc student housing doesn't have to do that at all so that's another so lower lower quality less cost no section 106 less cost yeah now, happening in cardiff is we've been getting the the local authority have been giving these accommodations planning permission and really late in the day the developers have been saying or, or one of the because there's a lot of different actors as well so someone in the chain is saying oh we can't let let, let them in time to all students. So can we have a temporary change of planning to let them to, the, to, let them to non students, which is being Ooh, that's interesting. And they normally wouldn't be given because it's not the right quality for non students, if you see what I mean. So I think there's a kind of a bit of a it feels like a bit of a scam going on mm -hmm. in terms of that, but underpinned by the very important points that Megan made about this huge financialization. So it's just the development finance just goes in quickly, comes back out, just extracting wealth all over the t all over the place, charging these horrendously high rents for folk, mainly taken up in Cardiff, certainly by international students who may simply not be coming anymore. And then you've got a really limited, you know, if you have to then change what those buildings are used for, what do you, there'll be really shitty one person small accommodation with these kind of strange large communal areas, which somebody then has to pay service charges to maintain. So they're really, really inflexible um, buildings that have totally changed our city and it just seem to just be all predicated on this extracting money out at every, at every point in, 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 the, in the process. This is, is such an, uh, um, Tamsin, thank you, it's such an interesting thing. We're actually gonna be looking at universities next week with um, Chris Cook is the sort of, it's his kind of mastermind subject. And so he is going to look at it. We've been looking at the overall broader finances of universities and what happens as a result of COVID and international students. And I suppose we should and probably could 
try and take a strand just to, to look at the student housing question. Um, we, we've talked a lot and it's quite difficult to do without being sort of, um, you know, a bit too kind of uh, metropolitan and indulgent, talk about the issue of student housing in city centres and the impact on built environments. But this way of looking at it, particularly around kind of broader commitment of housing developers to affordable housing, to community, given that all of that is now going to be in play, it seems to me, as people think through uh, cities. I think that's a really interesting thing. I'm, I'm just, I asked to see whether or not Alison might want to join in, because she, if I read it correctly, uh, is somewhere else, was looking at the setting. Alison, are you there? Do you want to, do you want to weigh in on this? Hi. Hello, hello. hello. Um, where, where are you? Forgive me. Right, I, I'm in Newcastle. Right, right. Well, you've got a lot um, of students. Yeah, it's got, it's got two oh. universities. Um, it's got large areas that were being developed, um, including this area called the Usburn, which is a really lovely kind of enclave, where, um, I, like, I think I said in my comment, it was the only game in town when I, I finished working there a few years ago, but I've, uh, I'm still quite, you know, I know the area. And from when I started and planning applications went into now, I mean, it's mind blowing really. Everywhere you look um, in this area, which has a lot of old historic housing, you see these big blocks are up. And, um, and both universities, Northumbria and Newcastle, rely, as everywhere now, on large numbers of um, foreign students. Um, so I agree that's a very good point. A, the one about what happens when our international students stop coming that's going to come up anyway i think in your thinking but also um it is a social thing which here in newcastle has been going on a long time now actually yeah um, students embedding or not and um so i i think it's worth seeing if you put this out to see who else might come in who really knows a good deal about this i did work for the council so that's how i kind of knew a bit about how helpless the planners were in this onslaught of applications because will you just will you just explain explain that Alison because I suppose someone like me thinks actually if I were a plan if I worked on the council if I were a planner I would actually be quite receptive to applications for student housing because I'm so worried about the hollowing out of my city centre that if people are going to come in and the beauty of students is they live there. Most of them won't have cars. They'll be they'll be they'll be living and essentially you know pumping life into the centre of a city. Um, I imagine that that as a rule, planners are actually quite positive when those applications come in. Well, actually, that's twinning with another thing I was going to suggest you ought to maybe begin to think about, which is. Um... Oh, it's a big issue of tourism. Um, you know how there's been this big blow up about over tourism in cities? Yes. And what's been happening there, and it's all been linked to Airbnb, is um, my God, too late in the day, we've realized we have these uh, deserts of, uh, of, of city centers. Well, uh, it's the same with student accommodation. Um, and your, your last call, I didn't catch your name actually, said it so well you know these are rabbit hutches bad quality rabbit hutches they are Thanks. not going to be filled forever and um councils were a so strapped for cash um look you know local government's been hollowed out never mind anything else um the planning uh, rules give no no support to planning officers who think actually there's enough of this going on yes um, and uh, so uh the two things and the business coming in and God help us now we've got these mega um, mega companies involved. Um, it, it's just a bit of a perfect storm. And um, so it's like so many things related to COVID actually, you're suddenly facing things that you have been trying not to think about. And this is another one of these, I think. <laughs> although you say that, Alison, and, and that could be depressing to hear, although I'm particularly enjoying the, the, the message on your whiteboard that says, Happy New Year 2020, just over your shoulder. So <laughs> that, that, <laughs> give, me, give me cheerful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna well, to bring it back. That's, that's, that's a COVID-related thing. That is my poor daughter down in London. She, yes. Whenever she comes up, she puts a message. Well, that was the last message I got. Oh my goodness, yeah. really? Oh my goodness. Well, I hope, I hope we get 
uh, enough of an easing for you two to get together relatively, uh, relatively <laughs> soon. Um, yeah. I was going to bring. I was. I, I saw that. I saw that Gail Addis had actually made a similar point, and I'd just like to wrap this up on student accommodation. Gail, you're you're there. I did you say in Glasgow? Is that right? But just in Glasgow, there's a whole area near Glasgow University. Um, right, it was the old docks down at Partick, yes. and there's a lot of blocks of student accommodation. And I think it's just the same stories in Edinburgh, Newcastle, Cardiff. Um, we've got a lot of these blocks that have been thrown up very quickly. Yes, um, uh, and this was an area that was that wasn't used for accommodation before, obviously. But I've often wondered what's going to happen, particularly with this, uh, what's going to happen next uh, when the students go. We've got a huge influx of, obviously, Asian students here, and I know the same's in Edinburgh. So when they go, what's going to happen to them? Can we use them to house the homeless? Because now we're housing the homeless after COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's another, another thought. Okay, well, I will, Gail, thank you. I mean. It, by the way, firstly, thank you to you, Megan, which has sort of set us down this particular path. I think we'll, we'll definitely take it away and pick it up with Chris and see whether or not we can follow up and try and pull something together. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Just listening to Cardiff and Newcastle and, and, and Edinburgh and um, actually, Megan, I didn't hear, where are you? Where were you? In Edinburgh. I'm in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, yeah. And just, you know, hearing around the country, this, this sort of similar pattern. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on if I can, because I just wanted to point people to the Tortoise News List. So one of the things that we're trying to do is um, kind of share with people what we're thinking about. The idea is, is absolute anathema, I should tell you, to journalists, is to have an open news list. You know, if you um, have ever um, worked in a newsroom, and I know some people who are joining us today have, you'll know that people guard the news list incredibly jealously. And often in my old newsrooms, the BBC or the Times or the FT, even on the day of publication, you'd have a news list that would have a fake page on the news list that would be the running order for the front or the top of the bulletin, because only a very small number of people knew what you were actually planning to run. The whole idea of the news was to, if you like, jump you with the surprise of what you had. Um, what we're trying to do is say, actually, you know what, we might get a, better stories and B, better angles and deeper insights on those stories if we try and open up. So if you look in the Tortoise app, if you're, if you're a Tortoise member or on a free trial, you'll see that we're starting to think through, okay, what are the big subjects that we're, that we're looking at? Um, I'm going to just talk through some of them with you just so you know um, what, we're, what, we're, what we're working on. We're in a host of different ways interested in what happens in the long term as a result of the failure of U.S. leadership, not just the personality of Donald Trump, but the absence of the U.S. Uh, in a global crisis in a way that none of us have seen in a century? And I suppose it's be epitomized overnight by the idea of non-payment for the World Health Organization on a permanent basis that uh, that the US, that, the, that Donald Trump has threatened. But it goes beyond that. It's, it's about the extent to which the US does or doesn't support international uh, organizations like the UN, the extent to which it provides example, it provides support for countries in most need. And given that we still haven't seen the second order uh, impacts of this crisis uh, in countries in Africa and countries in Latin America beyond just COVID-19 but in issues of food security, uh, employment, migration. Uh, all of that seems to us to be something that we should really try to understand and see see who steps in, if anyone, to the vacuum that the US is creating. So global leadership is much on our minds. I think there's a longer term look in the UK at how we're going to pay for it all. If you if you look again at the tortoise news list, that you know, we, we're beginning to hear that the Treasury's thinking is that it has to do a comprehensive spending review this summer, probably in July. At that point, that might also be the opportunity to do a budget and begin to spell out what it's going to do about the payment 
for programs like the job retention scheme, like the furloughing scheme, which are now running at a cost that are equal or probably a little bit ahead of the running of the NHS. And so these are the kinds of things we're going to look at. Um, I'm particularly interested in the Wuhan labs uh, allegations, conspiracy, and the trading of truths and untruths between China and the US. Um, we're looking at, at the domestic abuse question. We've talked about it before. We've talked about how it's being only very partially seen. We're now going to try and look at remote justice, how it's policed, and how uh, how the courts come back to come back to life. And you'll see if you look at the news list, there are a host of other uh, subjects that we're looking at. I'd be really interested if people have got points on those that uh, that, that are interesting um, uh, or people are interested in. Um, I'd, I'd love to come to Yasmin, actually, if I can, because you've got a, had a rat-a-tat-tat of good stories, not least this Kevin Mayer one. So, Yasmin, if I can, I'm going to ask uh, ask you to join us. What's How are you? Hi. Yeah, doing all right. I mean, the sun's shining, so that's... Really? that's yeah. <laughs> okay, you, and I, you and I share the same view on the outlook for the world. If the weather's good, it's good, and if it's not, it's not. So there you are. <laughs> yeah, and living in London, that's it's like a grim ratio to live by. <laughs> um, so there were a, a couple, <laughs> a couple of different things. Did you want me to mention yes, yes, yes. Tell all? Us what or... mind. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Sure. Um, so. I'm often interested in what's going on in the tech world and how that kind of plays out in the rest of society. And um, I think it was last week, or it might have been a bit earlier, Facebook announced its oversight board. So in 2018, Facebook, um, with all the Cambridge Analytica stuff going on, Facebook sort of said, okay, we're going to have an oversight board that's going to help us with content moderation. So, yeah. Um, and they announced it recently and it's got a few heavy hitters on it and I think they put about 130 million behind it as well. What's really interesting about it is that it's a question of is this the way that big tech is going to be regulated moving forward that you know they're going to set up their own boards and yes they're technically independent but how much are they going to actually be going to be able to change and and fundamentally when when facebook's business model is based on advertising and that advertising is based on people engaging in someone how much can they actually do so i think it's it's a, it's a really interesting thing to look at and a lot of the folks on the oversight board are heavy hitters you know they're not small folks yeah. you know and and a few of them have been quite critical um the previous head of the guardian uh, is is one of the members so that's quite interesting the other interesting new bit um, in the tech world is uh, Kevin Mayer, who was the head of streaming in Disney, has now moved over to TikTok as, head, as the head of uh, CEO of TikTok and CEO of ByteDance, who owns TikTok. And it's a Chinese company, but it's also interesting because I think TikTok has been a platform. We haven't had a new big social media platform for a yeah. few years now. Snapchat has kind of been in and out. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens there. What changes that mean? I mean, they must have paid him a big amount of money. I think that's right. Well, I think he'd already made quite a large amount of money at Disney, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he was the person that we were looking at when we were looking last year at trying to profile the sort of the modern impresario of media, of entertainment. Kevin Mayer was the person that we were, we were looking at. Um, and so it's a fascinating move, move that. And you're right, actually, we haven't, no one has really done a proper look at TikTok. One of the things we've tried to do since the beginning of the year is treat the technology giants like countries rather than companies. So we started uh, this year with uh, Apple as a tech nation and, and trying to sort of understand it, if you like, like a liberal China, like a country that was obsessed with control and uh, secrecy and organizational discipline, but all in the service of individual creativity and, and what that meant in the way it operated and how Tim Cook's China, uh, Tim Cook's Apple, sorry, had changed from Steve Jobs' Apple. You know, the next one that we're looking at is, is Amazon because of its sort of sole superpower status in the world of retail. And, and it, it feels like you're looking at a kind of United States of the, of the sort of 70s and maybe even 50s, 60s and 70s, where it sets the terms of trade for everything in the world. Um, 
but TikTok would be a really interesting one, uh, partly for the reasons of ownership that you say, but partly also because we always underestimate the extent to which new platforms change behaviours. So, so that, that's a that's a really a really good thought. We had, for what it's worth, yes, when we had uh, Hella Thorne Schmidt, who was the former Danish Prime Minister on our thinking last week, the AI summit, and she's just joined this Facebook oversight board. It's quite interesting, as you say, because people are putting, you know, their own reputations on the line, but it does seem to me that, that we've crossed a, a threshold in this crisis in which the Silicon Valley giants who've always said, hey, listen, we're just platforms. You can put on our platform what you like. We, we run the stage, we don't run the content have fundamentally changed and said, look, we do understand we're responsible for certain public health outcomes. We're responsible for policing the truth about, you know, vaccines, medicines, therapies, you know, some, you know, mad nutty ideas of what would or wouldn't work. So I think there's, there's something definitely interesting, uh, interesting in that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come, but Yasmin, thank you, and keep on peppering us with these ideas. Um, this is exactly, exactly what we're after. Um, I think that, I was just checking if anyone has got their, um, uh, their hand up. I, I would love to, if I can, bring in James Ingram. I don't know whether James is still there, because- yeah, I'm here, yeah. Are you there? James, can we just talk about, Wuhan labs and it might be the case that this is the two of us sort of in a very messy kind of classic newsroom conversation where neither of us actually know anything partly because there is nothing to know it may be that this is one of these hugely um, magnified non-stories but but what's your read on it I, I I think it's a oh yeah I don't I don't think anyone will necessarily know 100% I'm more interested in the implications of this debate which is huge um mm. The way what we ultimately decide as a world as the ultimate cause that will drive a lot of development funding and action by states um, and that has particular consequences for areas like wildlife conservation for instance um, where sort of poaching wildlife trade um, issues are quite big it's kind of because in the west we don't have sort of wildlife markets or the idea that as a local person for subsistence, you hunt to survive. Mm. It's not necessarily seen as a massive Western issue. It's not really picked up very much, um, but it's increasingly become a debate in the last few years, obviously rhino poaching, uh, elephant poaching. If you look on Netflix now, so many documentaries are getting proliferated about this issue. Um, and so depending on whether we think it was a bat or a pangolin, yeah. If that is the case, um, already like big conservation organisations are lobbying for stricter controls, um, which will affect the way of life um, for, for millions, billions um, in poorer parts of the world. So I think that's a, I think it's interesting to view that as in the wider context of a debate that's been going on for a, a bit of time yeah. about the wildlife trade, um, but that will only become more intense. It's really interesting you say that. We had Paul Polman, who was the old former chief executive of Unilever and is a big sort of climate campaign and now set up this business, Imagine, uh, in our thinking, I guess, a week, two weeks ago. And funnily enough, he actually framed this discussion about COVID-19 as a biodiversity question, similarly, about how, how things have and are crossing the species barrier in the way partly because we're eating into natural habitats partly also because the way in which people are eating uh eating differently so i think we'll we should definitely look at it i mean actually if i might though just because your comments um you know have james have sort of prompted a couple of my colleagues to make comments in the chat i'd love to i'd love to matt dan Cohen, are you there hi can you hear you, yeah i can matt what do you what do you make of the wuhan labs sort of issue and the broader thing that you know I guess James pointing out about that the nature of the the American political year ahead well it's uh, I think the, the 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 whole question of whether America on the global stage is is absolutely fascinating and I think the Wuhan lab story whatever uh, the truth turns out to be has already infected it uh, you're seeing a, a bipolarity emerging um, in American foreign policy uh, U.S. versus China, which is not by any means confined to the Republican side, though it is more crudely expressed, of course, by Trump in his 
you know, very um, uh, offensive um, remarks about the, the Chinese virus and telling the reporters off for calling it coronavirus and so on. Um, but it, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that Biden has been quite bullish on, um, quite hawkish on China as well. And, and I think that, that uh, it would be very interesting to see Biden's foreign policy uh, developing. Um, Giles uh, said in the Sensemaker uh, the other day that, that there was a, a kind of reinvigoration of the Biden domestic agenda and that he was trying to present himself as an FDR um, yeah. with appropriate caveats. I think on the foreign stage, um, it's true that Biden would want to, uh, as it were, um, repair a lot of the damage that has been done by Trump to America's reputation. However, I think it's a, a, an area of analysis to think that he, that means that, that a Biden presidency would mean a full-blown return to the kind of um, foreign interventionism um, that we've seen in the past. I think that the, the, the general trend of America away from being the world's cop um, it will continue whoever is president. And that, of course, has a, a knock-on um, question, which speaks, James, to the questions you've been raising about global leadership, which is most of the institutions that we kind of associate with global leadership, ranging from the G20, um, the various financial institutions we talk about, the UN, the WHO, NATO, um, are all really um, institutional expressions of American goodwill with international um, associate members joined in. If that American goodwill uh, is taken away, those institutions will look and will be funded in a very different way. And NATO is a, a good example of that. So I think it, as we're looking at the sort of post-COVID global order and hoping that the spirit of collaboration that everyone you know, is talking about survives, we have to be, there has to be a big dose of realism about how those institutions are going to fare and also a big dose of realism about the fact that that um, even if Trump is defeated in November, um, the, the direction of travel with America, you know, to, to a great extent, uh, withdrawing into itself and solving its own problems, economic and otherwise, is going to continue. Right. I, I, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. And I think, uh, Matt, thank you. I think it's really interesting. I think one of the the reason I come back to Wuhan labs is there was a really interesting note. I don't know whether you read, I don't know whether you saw Matt, the Ed Luce piece in the FT, yeah. which was a sort of read through of everything that Trump, really interesting. You, you know, Trump on COVID. There was this, there was this sort of extraordinary line at the end of it where he, he, he quoted Steve Bannon, you know, um, I think most people know, know Steve Bannon, you know, the architect of so much of the Trump campaign. And, and Bannon was, was asked, well, where does this lead in terms of 2020 campaigning? And, and given that nothing else is working for Trump, other than, as Bannon describes it, China, China, China. And, 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 and Giles, can I just come back to you? I'm, I'm going to bring in Alex Hudson in a moment. But just before I do, I just want to hear what you think on, the, on, on Wuhan Labs. Because the, the truth is, when we first talked about it or first heard it, it was an eccentric conspiracy theory. Then it became a conspiracy theory that was advocated or articulated by the president of the United States. Then, and then you found, I mean, it's then played in a meaningful way into diplomacy. I saw that uh, it, was, it was reported in one of the Australian papers, one of Rupert Murdoch's papers in the Australia, that there were one of the Five Eyes uh, intelligence groups had information on the on Wuhan labs, which was then strenuously de denied by the intelligence agencies, but not before the Chinese had responded with, you know, threats to trade against Australia. So, so it's having real world consequences. This, this, this report, even though it's un totally unclear whether it, it's remotely true. I think that's right. It's, um, it's there's a danger that it's already moved beyond the point where it matters whether it's true or not, which is, of course, territory where Trump and Bannon are at their most comfortable. Um, I, I still think, I remember sending you a gung-ho one-line email about two weeks ago saying, isn't now the time to send somebody to Wuhan, probably the safest city in the world, just after it'd come out of lockdown. Yes. Um, 
Uh, and I still think there's no alternative to going there and um, going and ringing on some uh, laboratory doorbells and just asking people or, or finding someone who's, who's willing to, which I suppose uh, implies that I still think, I mean, I agree with you that it's, it's worth getting uh, right to the bottom of this. But um, the conversation amongst the 40% 40 plus percent of American voters sticking by Trump at the moment, uh, all I think has um, uh, bad China um, baked in. Yeah. Um, whether, whether, it, whether it is a, a belief against the evidence that the virus um, escaped from a lab or that wherever it came from, China is the villain for um, failing to be candid enough with the rest of the world uh, uh, and, and, and WHO joined at the hip in that sort of obfuscation. That is a working assumption that will definitely survive through the next six months of electioneering to uh, November, first Tuesday in November. And, and uh, whether th then the political question in the States becomes, is that enough? for um, always Trumpers to forgive him, uh, give him a pass on mass unemployment. Um, yeah. I don't know. My litmus test in all this is my uh, Republican in-laws in Massachusetts, uh, where they swim against the tide. And um, it, is, it is striking and depressing how, um, uh, uh, what the committed they are. Uh, it, and, and I think there's a very large constituency of American voters who've got in so deep with Trump that pride alone will, will not allow them to, to disavow him now. And, um, <coughs> and um, uh, I agree with Tom Friedman um, in his uh, tour de force on, on Friday and saying an amazing amount depends on which of these two old white men gets voted in yeah. in, in November. But I, I do worry that uh, the bookies rather than the pollsters have it right at the moment and that despite everything, Trump wins. Amazing. Um, I, I will, um, uh, there's an angle here that we, that we may not uh, get to, but I just wanted to echo it, which is John Alexander is making, that Taiwan is an interesting element in all of this. Um, John was just pointing out that it, it, the speed of its reaction, that New Zealand talks about following the Taiwanese model, uh, and China has been blocking, of course, Taiwan's participation in the WHO. There's a, there's a really good piece in The Atlantic I'll just flag up, actually, about sort of Taiwan's moment in all of this. And I think it is a really interesting, uh, really interesting element, and a particularly interesting one for Republicans who've always been sympathetic to Taiwan, but the nature of Taiwan's response, of course, makes a mockery of the one that's been taken in the US. So it's a really interesting uh, interesting element in all of this. Um, can I just bring in Alex Hudson, who's had his, patiently had his, or her, his. Hello. Uh, hey, Alex, how are Hello. you? Hello. Uh, uh, very nice to see you. Alex, do, do, what's on your mind? Oh, have you frozen at the key moment? I think you've frozen. Let's, let's go back to him to see whether that's... Has Alex frozen? I think yeah, go ahead. a number of things. But, or have I not frozen? I, no, go ahead. Frozen or I'm, uh, next week uh, is all about... Um, our, our cover next week is all about the sort of... ...in China and the fact that the US and then China is a war of war. But so I'm working at you. I think it's just I think the UK responds to the relationships with China. So whether or not the excuse to have the different conservative led MPs who are primarily anti-China. So I think that's something really fascinating. I think there's so much anti-China sentiment within the UK Parliament that they're looking. For. I think globally, I think China's Batwoman. Uh, she's in Lee is. A fascinating case study of good science that used to potentially move into our markets. I also think about these relationships here and 
the fact that he has actually been um, funding, or at least part of funding, the, the labs around Wuhan, around animal testing. So this story has so many different parts, and then so we're, at Newsweek we're sort of working through them one by one by one by one. Right. Oh, hold on. Apparently, I'm cutting out. Uh, Alex, the line, the right. line, unfortunately, is really is really bad. Uh, uh, forgive me, Alex. I'm going to cut you off. But will you will you just MC, type into yeah. the chat because you're, the line, unfortunately, is really not great. So so forgive me. I'm I'm going to bring in Sam Houston if I might. Um, given we're having a conversation about U.S. politics, um, Sam, your name is <laughs> couldn't couldn't be more at. Um, how are you? It's a Scottish name, yeah. No, I'm very well, but uh, that's why I have to tell all my Texan customers. <laughs> Um, I'm calling uh, Trump finished. Um, that's the taxi driver of you, or my taxi driver of you. Um, I think um, the um, disinfectant moment was the, the straw that might break uh, the large camel's back. Um, it's uh, a long way to go uh, and ruling out a collapse uh, for, for Biden. Um, I just think, think he's finished. I think that the establishment won't get caught out again a second time. And I think that you know, interesting to hear what Giles said about the always Trumpers. I, I, it, I'm not a pollster, but remembering the figures from last time, he needs some middle of the road voters. And I think that yeah. the middle of the road voters that voted for him last time won't, won't do so again after some of the stuff that's, that's been happening most recently. Yeah. And Sam, just out of interest, can I ask you, are you what's happened? Uh, people who uh, are new to this call won't know Sam, but, but those of us who you know, fondly remember our times living in uh, our newsroom in Castle Street, saw Sam a fair, uh, a fair bit. Are you, are you back driving? What are you doing work-wise? Uh, personally, uh, not yet, actually. Probably later this week I will. Um, my estimate is, and, and, and our estimate is, that we're on about uh, kind of 10% of, of the normal uh, level of activity which is not dissimilar from from other businesses um, but but at the same time there's a lot of taxi drivers uh, who are still not working right can I ask you I just want to pick up on one small thing because we're going to close in a couple of minutes but Paul Atherton raises a point about it, it was actually following on on the from the point that Yasmin was making about privacy and tech but it was actually about uh, and I saw that Alison made this point about not using Amazon and then this question about what happens if you don't have a bank account and you don't want to use a card, you use cash. And I just wondered, do you think in the future you're going to change your attitude to cash? Do you think that you would be comfortable taking cash or do you think that, you know, money or cash money is just a vector of disease and you'd rather, you know, drive the cab and not have to handle other people's money? Uh, no, I mean, I, that, that was the case for me personally uh, a little bit in, in sort of late February, early March. But, but no, um, you know, everybody likes cash uh, still uh, for, for various obvious reasons. Uh, but I, I certainly think it's going to eat further into the, to the amount of cash that people use. But I don't, I don't quite buy the cashless society uh, in this country yet. I think there's still a, a useful... Um, uh, kind of reason for, for using cash and it's, it's not just the, the kind of the obvious reasons I think people like cash um, and and, uh, and I think that will persist for some time it, it won't stop me wanting to take cash but at the same time I mean we we've been taking cards for, for years now and I I marginally uh, prefer card because it's just easier personally Okay. Well, well, listen, uh, we're, we're coming up to the end, Paul, really nice, Sam, really nice to see you. And Paul, I'm sorry that we, we, I didn't actually bring you in on that question of cash. Katie Vanek smith my co-founder, has been suggesting that we should do something big on the future of money, of which cash would be one, one component. Um, and, you know, I think we are going to be rethinking cash. I think debt is going to be rethought in a, in a major way. So we'll come back to that. If you have thoughts, do let me know, and we'll certainly pick it up next, uh, next Tuesday. Um, we've got, and actually, fun enough, we can actually pick it up this evening because we have a thinking tonight on the world moving online, but particularly in retail. Um, the, the weird thing I think about moments like this is that people try and think of the very sophisticated unseen impacts uh, of a massive global 
disruption like this. And the reality is the biggest impacts are often the ones that are most obvious. And the most obvious one is the extent to which we've all been uh, shopping online and the extent to which that becomes permanent and reshapes everything from our high streets to our understanding of, of privacy. We're gonna be talking about those things tonight uh, um, at our thinking at 6.30. Please do join for that, it should be really interesting. Um, please do continue to weave in and contribute on our thinking on social care. It's one of those stories that you come across and you think, all right, you see the outlines, not just of a problem, but some elements uh, of an answer. And so we're gonna keep on looking at what, what can be done specifically around offshore financing of what's effectively a public service. Um, and then, uh, as I say, I hope that you're interested or like the new approach with the open news list. Do let me know what you think. Um, but for today, a uh, big thank you to all of you for making the time. Uh, hope to see you at our coming thinkings. Uh, and take care, wash your hands, keep your spirits up. All the best. Bye.